interesting thing about you know, Tony Awards is that they definitely help the longevity of a product, but the interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily guarantee a bunch of things behind the scenes, like, oh, I don't know, recoupment, right? Simons, I'm actually, this is my, these are my stomping grounds. I graduated from Columbia College as well as Columbia Business School. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my undergraduate studies were in both computer science and computer, uh, computer science and English with the majority of those in theater arts. I got my master's in business administration from Columbia B School in marketing and international business. And with that, I went into software. So I spent many years developing software for companies like HP, IBM, blah, blah, blah. I was a knowledge engineer for a number of years. Uh, developing artificial intelligence-based systems, and then I said I wanted to be an actor. And my mother thought that I was crazy, but I, that was my dream, and I went back to school and I got an MFA in acting at the University of Washington, moved back to New York and became an actor. In 20, 2009, I started producing because I got a disenchanted with the kind of roles that I was auditioning for. My first television audition role was for the role of a pimp. The second one was for a drug dealer. And then when I was about to go on stage in a musical called Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death as the fat suicidal black man, I was like, well, <laughs> maybe there's some other stories that can be told. So I started producing and in 2009 I, I started Simon Says Entertainment and we produce projects for film, for now television, uh, and of course Broadway, some off-Broadway and now we're moving into curriculum and gaming. I'm very excited about gaming because as you can probably tell, I'm a, I'm a big geek, I'm a total nerd. <laughs> and so this kind of feeds both sides of my, my personality, my A and B side. So anyway, as Matt mentioned, Broadway is this really eclectic kind of thing because from the outside it does look like the Broadway. But what makes up the Broadway is a number of disparate parts. Like even Broadway is consistent of 46 theaters in the Times Square area. And that sounds like a lot, unless of course you're a producer and you have a show that you want to move to Broadway, then it is a nightmare because it is a line and it is a wait and it is painful and you're always trying to manage the wind so that you can arrive on time when there's a theater and you never know when there's going to be a theater depending on a whole bunch of factors that I won't bore you with this morning. So not only on the, on the, the, uh, the theater side, there are several different, and there are some uh, collaborators, or rather, um, I guess you call them companies that o oversee a number of different theaters, um, but there are a number of different theater owners. Likewise, on the other side, the people who create content, people like me, there are a bunch of folks like me who are independent operators. Yes, there are some companies that are larger than others, like Joey Parnes and his production company and, and, and a number of others, but there are many, many people who are sole proprietors who create finance, develop, and produce shows for Broadway, and there are hundreds of us, okay? And the only thing that really kind of organizes us together is this thing called the Broadway League, which is a membership league that we pay membership dues to, and they represent and provide support for and give an outward face to Broadway. So if you ever see a Broadway commercial that's not a specific show, that's likely the Broadway League is promoting that. But if you ever see a, show, a commercial for a show, that's me. Okay? <laughs> that's because that's my money that's being spent to produce and create the advertising that amazing organizations like Spotco, who we've worked with, and you'll hear about one of our projects that we worked on together, they are, they're amazing. They're like, you know, the Rolls Royce of, <laughs> you know, advertising branding for Broadway, just FYI. <laughs> so anyway, that's sort of like the, 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 the big thing. And I'm going to say the last thing before I pass it on is that branding for, for, for Broadway is very similar to branding for any other company or any other industry, except that we do branding in a, and I would argue, a very haphazard kind of way, unfortunately. <laughs> the branding of a, of a project has to get past a certain point. And for that, I mean, for you to be, get a product, and what I mean is a product is a brand that is going to go beyond the borders of just New York City and become a brand. These would be things like Wicked, things, of course, like Hamilton, things that are national, global successes. That doesn't just happen. It's, it's a rare thing. Most people you will hear say Hamilton is a once-in-a-generation kind of phenomenon, and I completely agree. 
So you have to get past the early stages before you can even hope to have a brand because there are these people who are the early adopters in Broadway. They tend to be women, uh, white women between the ages of 40 and 60 <laughs> who tend to come out and see Broadway shows because it's on Broadway and that's what they do. They go see Broadway shows. So those are the people who you have to have in the house to get to the summer where if you have a brand that might appeal to a summer crowd, like I went to go see the other night, SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> I, whatever you say about the production, it has all the markings of becoming a brand. Time will tell, of course, we shall see. But to get to that branding phase, you've got to get past the early segments of it. And not every one of us, like me, because there's so many of us, have the, the, the background. I happen to have a degree in marketing, but not everyone does. Mm -hmm. People come to producing from, from acting, from directing, from you know, every aspect. There's no one path. Whereas in corporate America, you kind of come in, you know, as an associate, an intern in a marketing firm, and then you work your way up, or if it's in a regular corporation in the marketing department, and then you become a leader and you have this band of knowledge. And that doesn't always exist here in Broadway, which is, amazes me that we can ever get anything done on Broadway <laughs> and have successes because we are relatively inequipped relative to our corporate partners. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton on. Inequipped. <laughs> We're all inequipped. Um, but like Ron, my background is, act is as a performer um, before I got into marketing. So we all sort of come at this from different sides. Um, so Rogers and Hammerstein, um, we are a music publisher and a theatrical licensing agent. Um, so on the theatrical licensing side of the business, what that means is that um, in some sense we act like a, like a franchise. So Ron would produce a show. Um, we would then look at that show and say, you know, we think that has longer legs than just being Broadway. Um, and we would acquire that, and then we license those rights to theaters all over the country and all over the world. Um, and that's not just theaters. It's high schools, it's colleges, it's, it's professional theaters, it's amateur theaters, it's church groups. Anyone who's putting on a production of a show is coming to us for the rights to perform that show. You can't just go to your library, grab materials, and we're going to put on a show. Um, <laughs> So what, in essence, we act as is the, the long tail of Broadway. So everything Ron just said about Broadway is true, except Broadway is not just New York. That's right. Right, mm -hmm. so when we, when we think about Broadway, we think about this brand, and I think it, we're all sort of making Broadway and theater synonymous, but they're not, because there is way more theater happening outside of New York than there is in New York. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's about 14 million people see a Broadway show. About 14 million people see one of those shows on tour around the country, and then there are tens of millions of people that are seeing professional productions all over the country. Um, I think it's something like 80 or 90 million people are seeing a show in New York, in um, the United States alone. Um, so what licensing allows is for the artists who wrote that work, as well as the producers who invested in that work, to make money after the Broadway production or the touring production ends. Um, if every writer had to be involved in every production of their work, it would be unsustainable to continue creating more work. And so when people look at us and say, oh my God, you charge a high school to put on a show. Well, <laughs> because this, we have to, it's not just about the revenue. Um, although that is how the author makes their living and is able to continue making more art. Otherwise, it would, each author would create one piece of work, they'd go bankrupt and they'd be, you know, they'd end up doing I don't know, they'd be bankers. Um, although probably would be completely inequipped to do that as well. Um, so in order to, for them to be able to continue making art, more art, they have to be able to make a living, and licensing is the way to do that. There are many shows which close on Broadway in the red, they go out on tour, still don't recoup, and then in licensing, they're able to recoup. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a way that, you know, when we talk about why you would produce, it's, I mean, something like 70% of shows tank. That's right. Um, well, it's because you do Bad have. Business. <laughs> we we Bad do this for love, not for money. That's true. Um, so you know, you have to have another area where you can continue to make money long term. And authors might, ten years down the road, be starting to recoup um, their investment from the Broadway production. Um, I think on to Stacey. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was not a performer before I started working <laughs> at Spotco, but I will say that although people come to working in theater from all different walks of life, the one thing that is constant 
I believe, is a passion for theater and a true love of theater. So I was a lifelong theater fan. I worked for most of my career, um, actually in fashion and publishing. I worked at Vogue for a bunch of years. Um, and then I was really looking for a change. And I, I, because I love theater so much, when I found out about this possibility, this opportunity, it just seemed like a dream come true. Um, because it's a really unique um, way to work in theater without actually ha without actually being on stage. And I think that's something that's, um, for a lot of young students, really interesting to find out about, that you can actually work in theater but not be on stage. There are so many things that you can do. Um, so I, as Matt said, I am the executive creative director at Spotco, which means I oversee all of the creative campaigns, starting from the branding, meaning the logo, um, the artwork that's on the front of the theater or on the playbill, and then how that rolls out into um, all different kinds of things like outdoor advertising, TV spots, radio spots, um, social media, digital advertising. There goes my water. Um, <laughs> And really, however the brand, meaning the show, shows up in the world is the thing that I oversee. So that's messaging, tone, imagery, um, and always kind of keeping it fresh. Um, something that I think is interesting in terms of the evolution of Broadway advertising and the business of Broadway is how important the fans' feedback is. You know, 15 years ago, if you were if you were producing a show on Broadway, you put the show on stage and people bought tickets. You didn't really have the feedback that we have today from social media. And it's really changed the nature of, of the way we work. Um, so anyway, in a nutshell, that's, that's what I do and why I'm here. Um, Great. Yeah. Great, I think we have right <laughs> uh, backstage, you can switch over and we've got some nice yes. case studies because uh, <laughs> Stacy, of course, has worked with both Ron and yeah. with Dana on production. So we've got a couple of case studies to give you sort of little background perspective on the right. how, how did you get? <laughs> how did we get there? To where, where some of these things, both of these shows being successful, how did, the, how did you get to that place? So every production is a huge collaboration and I've been lucky enough to work with both of these people in different capacities on different shows. Um, so we're going to start with a show Show that Ron and I worked on together called A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. How many of you um, guys saw that show? Yeah. Yes. All right, that's not bad. <laughs> that's good. I'm going to take good. names for everybody who did not see that show. <laughs> so that was, I think, about four years ago um, that it was an unknown property. Uh, and branding an unknown property is very different than branding a Rogers and Hammerstein property where it's, you know, people have a connection and, and uh, an affinity to a show like Carousel um, or South Pacific. But we at Spotco work on a lot of shows that no, uh, that no one's ever heard of. Um, so it's a very different challenge. And I'm just going to show you a little... Um, this is like a little memory lane um, of options and to give you a little bit of insight as to how we go about branding a show. We get a brief from our producing partners. We hear everything that they know about the show at the time, but usually the show doesn't exist yet on stage, so we can't actually <laughs> see it. Um, and then we do a whole bunch of ideas. And this will just show you some of... Oh, Stacy, can I say something real quick? Yeah. yeah. Just so you know, for those who didn't see the show, uh, a Gentleman's yes. Guide to Love and Murder is a musical comedy about an Elizabethan, that's right, Elizabeth, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, royalty, uh, let me try to put this the right way, how I should say it. It's basically a serial killer, it's about a musical comedy about a serial killer who is trying to move ahead and become in the royal family by offing his cousins. That's the <laughs> core of it. So imagine a musical theater comedy <laughs> about a serial killer. That was the challenge, just FYI. It's Sorry. very dark and very funny. It, it, it's a really, really funny show. So the thing that we're always looking to do when we start to brand a show is really determine the tone. That is the number one most important thing. So you'll see here, these were kind of um, a little more serious where it's a lot about 
the gentleman. We decided early on that because it's such a long title that we thought nobody would be able to remember it, that we would help people out by emphasizing gentleman's guide, as opposed to, you know, so people didn't walk around saying, have you seen a gentleman's guide to love and murder? Um, they really started abbreviating it, and we, we, we encouraged that. Um, and then we, in our conversations, we realized that our original, some of the ones that I just showed you, were not funny enough, the tone was wrong, and we started going down this road of kind of whimsical comedy. Um, as Ron said, one actor plays eight roles, and he, he kills off all these people. So a, a lot of our ideas revolved around death and how this person was staging all of these deaths, in a, in a funny way, of course. Um, sometimes we do very simple marks on Broadway. Broadway for, for clarity and for readability. So here are a couple of ideas that did that. It had an out of town run that had got, and it got amazing reviews, which was a big reason as to why the producers decided to bring it to Broadway because out of town runs are a really important tryout for, for most Broadway shows. Um, and in the reviews for Gentleman's Guide, they used so many great words that we couldn't resist using them, <laughs> like despicable, ludicrous, diabol diabolical, absurd. Um, so we really played that up in some of our ideas. A simple mark, um, again, using the words, we started honing in on this character that we kind of called him the jib-jab guy um, and using this, the face of the actor named Jefferson Mays, who's an amazing, amazing Broadway actor, but the average, he's not a, he's not a household name. So we knew that we couldn't really rely. Uh, it was not a, a star cell right. by any means. Um, this family tree. So all of this to show you that we do a lot of work before we get to what we consider, before we start honing in. And we do this with the writer, the director, the producers, anybody who is a major stakeholder. Um, and finally, after lots of options, we kind of, and you can see some of them are really um, sort of wacky. We landed on this idea, which was the Jefferson Mays character on top of a top hat, because it is Elizabethan England, um, with these legs sticking out. And we thought that was, we, everybody agreed that this was a really good direction. It felt really right for the tone of the show. A beautifully executed new musical. Everything we did for Gentleman's Guide had this very tongue-in-cheek humor. Um, but at a certain point, and here you can see this was our final art. So we go from comp stage and then we finalize it with an illustrator. Um, we decided fairly early on that the top hat did not instantly signify musical to everybody. You know, some people in the know understood it, but we felt it was important to broaden our visual vocabulary, so we included this, an this giant anvil and a falling piano. Now, he never kills anybody with a piano, yeah, no. but we thought that we could take that, <laughs> that creative <laughs> license because it was actually really useful to us because as soon as you saw this giant piano on the marquee, people understood this was a musical. And we're always trying to give as many clues as to what is what will help people actually buy a ticket. And if somebody thinks that a musical is a play, that won't really serve the show very well. Um, so here you can see our, our character in all of these precarious situations on, on a bomb. Um, I, in the life cycle of the show, we have a lot of major um, touch points. So there's the preview period, there's the opening period, there is the Tony campaign, because there's really nothing more important in the world of, of Broadway theater than winning a Tony Award. It really guarantees the... Um, a future for the show, <laughs> both in New York and on tour. So we take that very, very seriously at Spotco. And as soon as the reviews come out, you know, for this particular show, that was really 
relatively unknown, we got these amazing quotes, one of which was, the, undi the new undisputed king of musical comedy. Well, you really can't ask for a better quote than that, so we put that everywhere. And this just gives you a feeling for um, some of our post-opening materials. We made a choice at one point that we really wanted everybody to know how funny it was, so you can see that we really went big with all of the <laughs> sources. Sure? That was it hilarious? It was hilarious. <laughs> it was. And then we were lucky enough to not only get the most Tony nominations that year, um, but we won the best musical, which is, you know, the big dream. Cha Ching. And I should say, I should say that you know the interesting thing about you know Tony Awards is that they definitely help the longevity of a product. But the interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily guarantee a bunch of things behind the scenes, like oh I don't know recoupment, right? So you would think that now as it, sh as it turns out, this show did recoup. But I've also produced shows like. Porgy and Bess, uh, mm -hmm. the Christmas Porgy and Bess, they did not fully recoup. It, may, it did very well, it won the Tony, Audra won a Tony, it was a lot of Tonys flying around, but it didn't help putting money back necessarily in the pocket, so it's not a guarantee. But I will tell you, from a business point of view, the Tony nominations are incalculably important. Is that a word? Incalculably <laughs> any rate, that because we actually didn't almost stay open. Mm -hmm. We were gonna close the show in the winter before the Tony Awards because even though we opened to rave reviews, love letters, it didn't translate immediately into ticket sales. We actually had to borrow money to keep the doors open in the hopes that when we got to the Tony period that we might get some Tonys. And fortunately, all things crossed, we got Tony ten, t 10 Tony nominations, and that is the only reason why most of you will have even heard of that show, because mm -hmm. had we not gotten to that, we would have closed, and that would have been one of those many things in the analogs of Broadway of, yeah, it was a pretty good show, but nobody saw it. <laughs> and there are tons of shows that fall into oh, that category, yeah. right, where it's yes. a great show, no one sees it, it, it doesn't make it to Tony season, it ends up in licensing, and then does blockbuster business in licensing, and people see it at their local community theater and yep. or regional theater and the show takes on a whole new life. Licensing is incredibly important. I, I produced another play called Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, which was a comedy written by, in my opinion, Chris Drang's best play. It's very, very funny. It was the most licensed title mm -hmm. that year, right? It was for a number of reasons. It was a very small cast. It was like, five, I think it was a five-hander. Um, Sigourney Weaver did not tour with it, though she played you know, the lead character here on Broadway. But it did booming business and put money back in the pockets of all parties concerned because of the licensing. It's so key. So here, to, uh, to I'm rolling? just going to click through some yeah. of the examples of how our advertising appeared in the world. I think, as, as we said earlier, Broadway is really um, a tourist destination for New York. And, it, you know, part of working in the Broadway arena that is exciting and always, uh, I don't know, it kind of never gets old, is that your work really becomes a part of the New York landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, you know, you can see billboards, I mean, of course, websites, digital. We did tons of social work for this show because the sense of humor really lended itself to it. Um, and then, of course, eventually shows <laughs> close, and you can see how we applied the sense of humor to our closing announcement, um, going out of business sale, and we just always really had a lot of fun. And I will say that part of a successful partnership on Broadway is having a great relationship with your producers. It's almost like, for, for an advertising agency, it's almost like we are good marketers. We can only be the best marketers we can be if we have a partner who says, give us your craziest ideas and nothing is off the table. We meet on a very regular basis, like once a week, to discuss ideas. There, no idea is a bad idea um, when the relationship is good. It doesn't always work that way, but that's really an ideal situation. Um, now, on to another show that's entirely different from uh, Gentleman's Guide is a Rodgers and Hammerstein show, of course, called Cinderella that was on Broadway. 2013. Yeah. So Cinderella 
we, I think we all sort of think of instantly, we're thinking of the Disney Cinderella. Um, which is a challenge for this show. So Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella um, has been around since the 50s. Um, and, um, you know, the, the first version of it is the Julie Andrews, um, which was made for TV um, up until, I think, the, the, um, the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. It was the most watched television event live. Um, I think it was like 109 million people um, tuned in to watch it. Um, when TV was live in 1957, right? right? right. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, with Cinderella, there are a few challenges. The first being that we have to make sure that nobody thinks this is the Disney Cinderella. The Disney Cinderella is not really a musical. Um, uh, Cin Roger Hammerstein Cinderella is in my own little corner, impossible. Um, ten minutes ago, a lovely night. Um, there are some unbelievable songs that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote for the show. Um, and... There have been many, many versions of Cinderella, so we can click through. So yeah. this is the original. Then uh, Leslie and Warren recreated it for TV about 10 years after Julie Andrews, um, a totally different look. And then in the 90s, it was done by Brandy and Whitney Houston, um, which is my version of Cinderella. Um, <laughs> and I think that is the thing about Cinderella that um, is, is so interesting, is that every generation of women specifically have their Cinderella. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as Stacy's team starts looking at the art, the, the history of Cinderella is something that really has to be kept in mind. But this was the first time it had ever been on Broadway. And I think everyone sort of went into it thinking like, of course Cinderella has been on Broadway. And it had never had a live stage production. So... Amazing. It's amazing given it being a Rodgers mm -hmm. and Hammerstein piece that yeah. it had never had its chance on stage Well, it's the before. only show that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote for TV. TV. Mm, that's right. So when we got involved, we did our wide exploration of options to determine what the best look would be. Here are a couple of them. Right, and um, instantly I see Disney. It, this, right? is, this was to Disney. But we, we thought it was a fun way to really play up some copy, but we decided not to go in that direction. We worked on a couple of very simple marks that really played up the name. Of course, The Stroke of Midnight. Um, you know, the challenge with working on an iconic show like Cinderella is that it really has to be true to its, what the core intent of the music, what, what, the, what the intent was, but it also has to appeal to a modern audience today. So it kind of straddles the world between uh, something that is sem somewhat old fashioned, but not in a stuffy or, or dusty way, and something that feels really modern and relevant. Well, and so, this has a, had a new book, which was written to, to bring it into a contemporary light. So this version of Cinderella was really all about the Cinderella being the hero of the story. The prince doesn't save her. She doesn't accidentally leave her shoe on the, on the steps. She, she puts it there very intentionally um, as, as a means to rescue the prince. Um, so, you know, it, it had a very different message. But I think also Cinderella poses a unique challenge that's even a different challenge than The Sound of Music or South Pacific might have mm -hmm. in that this is also in the public domain, right? So anyone can create a version of Cinderella. You, you know, you could create a musical, you could create a straight play, whatever you want to do with Cinderella, it's public domain. Um, and so there are lots of versions of Cinderella out there, even beyond Rodgers and Hammerstein and Disney, although those are the most well known. So this is just to show you the look that we landed on. It really felt, it, it feels romantic, uh, somewhat magical, but it also has a modern relevance uh, to today. So that was the thing that we were really going for. We, are, we always work on copy and taglines that we think help to uh, inform the consumer. Glass slippers are so back, we just thought it was a really fun way <laughs> of saying, you know, this is Cinderella, she's back um, in, a, in a contemporary voice. So here you could see um, how it appeared on the theater and in some other situations. So this is um, the licensing artwork. So one of the challenges we have in licensing, um, which is very different, I think I compared this to, to the, the franchise business. One of the things that's really different about what we do is that we are licensing a property that can be produced in numerous places all at the same time, but we can't get in the way of that major 
uh, first class production, so the Broadway production. So Cinderella closed on Broadway in 2016, I think, um, and it's been out on tour ever since, and it's do, it has done unbelievable business out on tour. Um, but Stacy's art is going to be on the, the, th the major theater in town that's taking a touring production. If we license a high school, we can't let it have the same branding image um, because it would be confusing, right? How do, oh, maybe, maybe for some reason they're licensing out the, the high school and that's where it's going to be. And then you buy your tickets and you realize I'm seeing a high school production of Cinderella. It's not what anyone wants to do on their Saturday <laughs> night, um, I assure you. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have Depends this on the very, high school. Right? <laughs> there are some great high school productions out there, but, you know, it's not, it's not a, a Broadway tour. Um, you know, so we have this very unique challenge and how do you make sure that people understand this is the same show, but it's not not the same production, yes. right? And, and it's, it's a very unique challenging to theater licensing because we, you know, in an ideal world, you would want every production of Cinderella to look exactly the same. You'd want consistent branding. You'd want to be able to hand out, here's your kit. Don't vary from this kit. Well, it doesn't work because we can't have this conf conflicting branding from producer mm -hmm. to producer because your production of Cinderella is not going to look like my production of Cinderella. Right. Um, so, it's, you know, you're not, when we're licensing a show, we're not licensing the production, right? It doesn't come with the sets and the costumes and the director's vision. It's just the script and score. So every person who produces Cinderella gets to put their own unique take on it, as long as they don't vary from the script and score. Um, so our goal with this art was to make sure that we were, we were referencing the Broadway production without ever allowing it to be confused with it. Um, so we talked about, can we use the glass slipper as the icon? Well, that was a little bit too unique to this production. And so we tried to stay within the vein of the color palette um, because all of our previous versions of Cinderella had a, had a very different color palette. But when we looked back historically, as I showed you with the Julie Andrews and Leslie Ann Warren and the Brandy Whitney Houston, purple has always sort of been a consistent theme. Um, really, I think, drawing from that royal color. I think, I think that's it for our slide. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have one. I think we'll we'll get to some audience questions. Hopefully, I mean I have lots of things that I could probe uh, on this, but one that didn't come up in this this interesting thing of right the, all the brand challenges of Broadway itself, of the individual show, of the show goes out on tour, of the fact that right seventy or eighty percent of all shows fail. Mm -hmm. This is a, an organization in which most things don't do well, even when they're good product. Right when we talk about brand. Very often it's like it starts with having a great product or service first and if you get that then everything else usually can, you can find ways for it to take shape. And of course this is a universe in which even that doesn't happen. Um, but the one influencer I would say that we haven't talked about is the New York Times. Mm. Right? So this is again success or failure. Tony Awards you were talking about can make or break it. Another huge one is, right, critics and reviews. You did it, but talk to me in particular about how even that has borne down. There's like a market share of one when it comes down to the most, the influence of yeah. a successful show in terms of critical review. Yeah, uh, reviews are very important and the New York Times is sort of the crown jewel therein. Um, and though you might get a love letter from the New York Times and they might love it. Does it necessarily mean that the show will be successful? But you can pretty much guarantee that if they give you a pan <laughs> and they think that your show sucks, she's probably not going to get to week three. Not necessarily. But there have been exceptions to this, right? Because you've seen, for example, a very marketable, which means seemed very reasonable, well-known brand um, of a musical that came out called Rocky, right? Rocky was, seemed to have all the earmarks of an absolutely branded, long-term success project. It's well-known, well-loved brand. It's just going to kill. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. Some people felt that the show was uneven. Um, I won't disparage the production at all, except to say that it did not get a love letter from the New York Times, and they spent millions of dollars 
on that production. And for people like me who come in and produce along with other lead producers, because I, I didn't mention this before, and it's probably academic at this point, but there are different kinds of producers. There's the lead producers, of which there are two to five people, could be one. Then there are co-producers who, if you look at your playbill and you see all their names above the title, those people are referred to as co-producers. Those people actually are award eligible. Should the show be nominated for a Tony, you yourself could actually get a Tony. And by get, I mean buy, because the, you don't have to, you don't get a Tony. You actually have to buy the Tony after you win the Tony. Did you know that? Did you, any of you know that? Only the lead producers actually get a statue. If you're one of the co-producers and you win the Tony, that means you get the, win, the opportunity to buy a Tony. But I digress. So that is a brand and that is a product where whereby the New York Times didn't pan it, but it certainly was not mm -hmm. a runaway hit, and that reflected in ticket sales. And so I, I will say this, in the past, the New York Times was everything. Because we didn't have things like, you know, as Stacey mentioned, like uh, social media, which is a huge influencer now, because people are talking about shows. And I'm gonna tell you this, that certain types of shows have different needs in terms of how they're marketed. For example, if you do a show that might likely have a very high African-American um, population who would, might want to see the show, um, spending money on the New York Times is not a good buy. Um, African-Americans, we tend to listen to the radio. Radio is a really good buy. That would not be the case for most shows on Broadway. Um, they're they're going to spend money on ads at the, in the New York Times. Everybody spends on social media. But now that the New York Times is one of just a number of things that are considered uh, influencers in, 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 the, in the business. And for example, with African-American shows, word of mouth is everything. Absolutely everything. I can't tell you, I, my last production of Jitney, Everybody heard of that. If you were African American and you were in the city of New York, if you didn't hear about Jitney, you didn't go to church, you didn't go to school, you didn't go to work, you have no friends in any of the African American affinity groups at all, right? It was, I had people coming up to me literally months after the show closed. Oh, you did Jitney? I can't wait to see it. And I'm like, well, the good news and the bad, and that's another thing about black folks, I won't even bore the rest of you here with, we tend to want to come to things late. We kind of want to get there right <laughs> just before we close. <laughs> you know, cause gonna, that's happened to me with, we did a streetcar named Desire, an all person of color, and we couldn't give tickets away. Those last two weeks, stand in the room only. I'm like, where were y'all like a month and a half ago? You know what I mean? So anyway, I say all that to say that the New York Times is still yep. very important. It is. But it does not guarantee success, nor does it necessarily guarantee immediate failure. Yeah, and you really can't underestimate or predict what word of mouth will be. And that is not only in the African American <laughs> community, it's it's across the board on Broadway that if your show gets an amazing review, but for whatever reason does not get any traction with people to get them talking yes. when they're walking outside of the theater, literally in that moment, that if they're not inspired to tell their friends or, the, or somebody next to them to see the show, it will have a very hard time retaining an audience. Right. Um, and the New York Times critics are absolutely they, they can close a show. That is how powerful they are. But in terms of advertising in the New York Times, it's not as popular as it once was, right. as you said. Right.